My name is Keith Willett. I'm the principal of uh, Cobble Lane Grammar School. Um, and tonight I'm going to be saying a few words around Year 7 along with um, Mr. John O'Brien and Mr. John O'Dwyer and um, Ms. Hayley Rathbone. So uh, between the three of us, we'll communicate as much information as we can and hopefully there'll be some, some questions as the evening goes on as well. So welcome. Acknowledgement of the country. Cobramankin Grammar School acknowledges the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which our school is located and where we meet here today. We pay our respects to ancestors and elders past, present and emerging and extend our recognition to their descendants who are present. They hold the memories, the traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the nation. We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of this continent whose cultures are among the oldest living cultures in human history. Cobbermann Grammar School is committed to honouring the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's culture and spiritual relationship to the land, water and seas and their rich contribution to society. So this evening, um, I've introduced myself, I've introduced Mr O'Dwyer, I've introduced um, Hayley over here. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I'd also like to introduce this evening to our school community, first time publicly, over here, this uh, fine looking gentleman, Mr John Thompson, who's here with Good his partner, partner oh, yeah. Josephine, so we welcome you here tonight. <laughs> so John is, and uh, has been appointed, recently appointed as our head of senior school, commencing in 2023. Um, it was a, a very long and rigorous process. Uh, I felt we had a really quality field of applicants and uh, it's with a lot of pleasure and also anticipation that I'm um, looking forward to uh, having John come over to our school in 2023. So John comes from Cobham Secondary College. He's got a vast experience in curriculum um, right across the senior school, particularly at the higher year levels and uh, certainly had a lot of experience around wellbeing and behaviour management and all those things that we occasionally need to think about um, at schools. So John's here this evening um, as a parent um, when uh, he has children at our school. So welcome John and welcome Josephine. Great to have you here. And looking forward to next year very much. So some of you who are familiar with our school, um, some of the information here tonight uh, will not be new to you, but there's a few things that I would just like to touch upon as the evening goes on. Um, one of the things that's really important to us at our school is student wellbeing, and uh, this last 12 months in particular, we've really put some energy and some resources, financial resources, into that area. Um, most schools would probably say that the return to school from the COVID experience and the remote teaching and learning uh, hasn't been completely easy or seamless. There's lots of young people out there and adults, um, I guess, who are, who are readjusting. And uh, so it's important that, that our families know that um, we have a really vibrant wellbeing team. So we have Miss uh, Vanessa Wanos, who is our Head of Welfare and Child Safety Officer. Uh, Vanessa's full-time. Um, she's available to our students uh, any time a parent would like to make a, a booking. And sometimes some of our students We'll self refer to Vanessa. We're also really, really lucky to have Dr. Kevin Quinn, a school psychologist. So, Kevin's here two days a week. He has fantastic experience. Um, the fact that our school can resource a, a doctor of psychology for two days a week and he just be at our, our service is something that um, we're very fortunate to have. So, please remember any time, whether it's um, whatever you think the need might be, if you have a young person who you feel needs a little bit of advice or support around wellbeing, um, then we certainly have the staff who can, who can do that. Our curriculum. So curriculum in the uh, secondary setting is really dictated up to a large extent by the Victorian Government um, through VCAR, Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority. Um, if we have a look here, we can see that um, we have a series of core subjects. Uh, these are the subjects that fundamentally are mandated by the government. And then we have a range of elective subjects uh, that exist across year seven and eight. And across that year seven and eight experience, 
our students uh, rotate through those elective subjects. I guess you could call them a taste of experience. What we're trying to do is offer them a, a breadth of experience in those electives across years seven and eight. And we can see the, um, the core subjects there. So what we're trying to do and really position ourselves into the future in our secondary setting at our school is as well as maintaining a really rigorous and high academic outcome for our students, we're also moving into that area where we're making sure we're offering up opportunities for applied learning pathways for our young people. So our students, they go through the secondary setting. If they're a young person who wants to pursue a professional career, go to university, all of those things, um, we can cater for that. And, and of course, there's lots of young people out there who the university pathway might not be the way for them. And so we're really positioning ourselves over this next 12 months to two years with um, some infrastructure and introduction of new subjects that allow us for that applied learning pathway through to the end of their secondary school. So there's lots of exciting things happening in that space. Um, I wish I could talk a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, just waiting on a couple of things to happen in, a, in, in terms of bureaucracy and hoping to make some good announcements around that soon. Um, there's a couple of comments there. Uh, I don't really need to read that out to you guys. Um, what I would just like to touch upon here really quickly is that um, our Year 7 curriculum, we have 30 lessons per week, so 26 core lessons and 4 elective lessons per week. Um, and around that too, the other thing that we're implementing in 2023, on Wednesdays we're introducing a 7 period day, so it allows us to have a dedicated period on Wednesdays to things like chapel, uh, to things like um, sub-school assemblies, uh, to things like homeroom gatherings pastoral care and wellbeing um, activities with our young people. So looking forward to that being implemented next year. Uh, a, a, dedi a period on the timetable dedicated to those things. Any questions uh, along the way will be most welcome. Our timetable, here it is. This is what a, a, a typical day on our timetable looks. Um, we actually have a, a week of it here. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, it's pretty straightforward. If we have a look at uh, the Monday, reading down through that, we can see that this particular group on a Monday starts with homeroom with uh, Mrs. Laura Roach. Uh, they go into an elective session, uh, one group doing foods, one group doing outdoor ed. Uh, they then have a Chinese um, in period three. In, in, the, in the afternoon, we have a double English. Um, and I guess if you read through that, uh, and you were, if you were to refer to the previous page of our course subjects and electives, you can see where they've been covered across the timetable. Um, I don't think I need to say too much more about that. And then uh, on the right hand side, there is our bell times. Um, they, they, those bell times are representative of what we're doing in 2022. Um, uh, next year, they'll change slightly with the introduction of the seven period day on Wednesdays. All of that information, by the way, will be passed on to families as we um, nail down those new arrangements. Okay, are there any questions about any of that to this stage? So I'm now going to ask Mr. John O'Brien if he'd like to come forward and talk to us about things like sport and co curricular activities. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mr. Willem. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so our co-curricular activities, uh, we provide the students with a number of opportunities to excel uh, in a, a number of different uh, activities that they can go in. And as you can see, some of them are the public speak speaking, our human-powered vehicles, which have sort of been on hold since COVID hit, but um, hopefully it will get up, running, up and running in the, the not-too-distant future. Uh, sporting events, our debating club, computer programming, and academic competitions. And can I say, we've had some real success, um, you know, computer programming, we've won medals at um, national level and things like that. So there are a lot of opportunities for, for kids of all sorts to really excel and things like that. We also um, it really encourage and uh, endorse that relationship externally with, uh, with sporting organisations around the, around the town, um, such as the last um, the swimming club, uh, we've just had the canoe club come in and, and give us a talk about people getting involved with that. Again, we've had kids do that and, uh, and are performing at national level. 
So again, a lot of opportunities um, for our students to excel in what they're good at. Um, our camps, so the Year 7 camp, we go off to Parambola, uh, usually at the start of the year, so it allows the, the students to uh, make those connections with one another, um, that real team building emphasis, and, uh, and that growth of leadership skills. Uh, as you can see from the photos, there's, uh, there's some, the one in the middle with the, with the kids in the pool, uh, that, that was a great team building exercise where they have to build a raft out of uh, just materials that are placed in front of them. Um, so a lot of problem solving, things like that working together. Um, so you know, at the start of the year, that is a great camp for the year sevens to really connect with one another um, so they can then uh, prosper as a group going forward uh, in the coming year and things like that. So, um, yeah, really, really great camp, really well run. They not only uh, get to uh, be involved in all these great activities, uh, but the, the camp leaders and things like that made them, make them do the actual chores that are involved. So the setting up for dinners, uh, the cleaning up after dinners, you know, having bedrooms organised before they leave in the morning, uh, having to be at certain spots by certain times, so again, all that time management and organisation, which is essential, you know, making that transition into the secondary school uh, becomes invaluable. So yeah, it's a really great camp uh, to kickstart out here. So Mrs. Rathbone, your turn to come up and she's going to talk about transition program. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm the current year six teacher. So one of the benefits we have being a peer to 12 school is our ability to trans is transition our kids over into year seven. And so for those of us who are staying around for year seven currently, we have a really good program that we set up um, and a really good knowledge of the students that we get to share with our year seven teachers. So that's something we do pride ourselves on. So our current transition program for the year sevens uh, is in term four, and we have three days that we do. So we start with a very small transition of just two periods, so an hour and a half, just a bit of a get to know you, come in, learn what it like, it's like to sit in the senior part of the school. Then the following week we go to a half a day, so three and a half hours, and that's where we actually give them the opportunity to spend some time with their teachers, try different activities that they probably haven't tried before. So things like woodwork, foods, things that a secondary school is able to provide that junior schools aren't or primary schools aren't. And then our very last day is a full day, which is the 6th of December, which will be our entire school's transition day. So they'll move up into Year 7 for the day and get to spend the entire day being a Year 7 just before the end. So it's a really nice way to, to give them a little bit of a taster. For children who don't come to our school, these days are still open and welcome to join and we really encourage you to come because it's a great way if you don't know other students to come and meet them and really slowly get to know people rather than being sort of thrown in deep down the first day next year. So it's a really great day that we have and something we really pride ourselves on. Okay, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable with this slide. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm also head of sport here at um, Copperman with New Grammar. Uh, and I really pride ourselves on what, uh, what we can achieve as a small school. So we are connected um, as part of the Gold Murray um, Secondary Schools Division, so GMDWSV, uh, which is a part of the Hume region and of course our, our overriding body is the School Sports Victoria. Uh, as you can see there, we have our three main carnivals, if you like, that we perform at school level. Uh, that is our swimming cross country and athletics, which, which we've just come off uh, last week and had great participation. Um, they can all lead to bigger and better things, so uh, going off to uh, divisional um, and new uh, regional, uh, and if you're lucky enough, state. Uh, uh, yeah, state selection. I'll use Alex as an example here. Uh, Alex is a pretty accomplished swimmer, and the last two years he's been uh, off to state to, to train his wares against the, the best in the state uh, and six this year in, in the state final in the breaststroke. So, again, you know, we keep well above our weight um, in the um, Golden Murray. So, as you can see, the bottom sports uh, for the year seven so are able to be involved within a school sport. Um, so we have two sports days for the year. We have our winter sports day and a summer sports day. So those sports are broken up into winter and, and summer sports. 
um, and a, a number of those also can lead to bigger and better things. So our senior girls um, badminton team, they just recently went down the state and ended up fourth in, in the state, uh, being the best performed country um, side in both uh, boys and girls. So, um, you know, I'm really proud of the, the uh, status, I guess, that we've created for ourselves and uh, definitely love the, the year sevens of 2023 to continue that on. Um, and that goes up to the event year 10. We don't sort of promote it as such at 11 and 12, but, um, you know, we definitely up to year 10, really, uh, really promote the kids getting involved and being active. As you can see there, um, our sports uniform, which we'll come on uh, into a bit later, uh, but yeah, they're expected to wear their sports uni uniform and wear it proudly as they represent the school. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going okay in that, uh, that area. Mr. Willard. Thanks, Mr. Jordan White. So, it's too boring to talk about fun things, I get to talk about homework. <laughs> Um, I get lots of questions about how much homework should a young person do and uh, I guess I've lots of different opinions around that. Um, first thing I say is we live in a really busy world. Uh, the last thing I'd want is for our young people to be going home from school, having to do hours of homework every night of the week and on weekends. So um, certainly that's not an expectation for me or our school. Um, on the other hand, uh, experience would tell me that um, for all levels of achievement, particularly once we get into the secondary setting, um, the young people who can organise themselves and develop the habit of doing some homework, probably I would say four nights a week, certainly uh, the results for those young people as they move through the secondary setting uh, are much better than those students who don't do any homework at all. So I think from year seven, what we're trying to do is really encourage our young people to get into a habit of doing some homework and um, we've got here is a pretty rough guide. Um, the year seven students allocate somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour for homework uh, per night. I would probably say that's Monday to Thursday night. And uh, that leaves the weekends free to do whatever you feel as though you need to do. Um, but it's, I think that's a really important thing. Homework, like most things in life, is a skill that we develop. And if we get into that habit and, and that skill of making sure that we're doing some homework in year seven, particularly as we move into year 10 and 11 and 12, when it is really critical that young people who want to succeed with their studies do a reasonably significant amount of homework per week um, and study per week. Um, if they've set themselves up with those good habits in year seven and year eight, then that's a, a real advantage as they go through into the upper end of the senior school. One of the things that we do offer at our school is a homework club that uh, takes place every Wednesday. It's thrown after school from 3.15 and 4 p.m. Um, that particular homework club has staff in attendance to support young people and give them a little bit of advice. Um, I know that we are largely a busing school, so that's not always convenient for families, but um, if you can find a way for occasionally your young person to get to those homework clubs, it's got some really good benefits. And indeed, we, we, have, we have little groups here at our school, friendship groups of students who actually turn the home, homework club not only to a really valuable opportunity to do some homework and touch base with their teachers, but also a pretty relaxed setting to um, spend some time with their mates as well. So that's, that's a good outcome. Okay, computers. At our school, we have a BYOD program. BYOD means you bring your own device. Um, so this program has certainly been in place in my time at the school. Uh, there's a couple of points here around um, what our program uh, allows our students to access. So access to school resources, including a student email. Um, our teachers use um, technology these days for not so much uh, classroom teaching, but certainly the opportunity to send work home with young people. Uh, the, the program offers access to digital textbooks, which is, uh, can be very convenient in, in, in many subjects. Uh, we offer industry standard software um, that gets um, loaded onto students' devices. Uh, we have wireless connection to our school, and that gives our students access to printers, um, the internet, and other network resources. 
to the beginning of the year any new students bring your laptops in the IT department um, take those laptops configure them to uh, all the different elements of IT around our school and from there the young person takes their laptop away and hopefully all is good. Um, the BYOD program the requirements for that or the process to get organised for that and the information around that will be sent to uh, all families towards the end of term four to be ready to start the following year. I'm 58 years of age, I'm not an IT expert. If you've got any questions about IT, James is here, he could be the man for that, not me, thank you. Any questions about IT and BYOD? Thank you, that's good. Uh, communication. Over here in the corner we have a young person called Patrick Tanzi. So Patrick or Paddy has been with us for uh, about six months now, Patrick? Just under that. So Patrick has, was appointed a community relations officer. Um, his job is to get out there in the community and do lots of different things in relation to our school, but particularly communication is an important part of, of Patrick's job. Um, people have been with our school for a good time now and we realise that uh, probably our, our major school newsletter, The Cry, uh, which used to be published three or four times a term, is now only being published at the end of each term. It's certainly a much more significant document than it has been in the past. And at the end of each week, uh, Patrick produces a smaller bulletin, information bulletin called What's On, and that gets communicated uh, to our families uh, uh, via email, Patrick. Sorry? And hard um, So we have, currently we have Class Dojo as well as a significant communication app for our school. Um, Class Dojo has been in operation at this school and many other schools now for a good while. Um, as I speak, we're currently investigating um, alternative communication apps for families. Um, and I think probably as we go into 2023, there's a good chance that um, Class Dojo could be superseded by a different sort of communication. Um, we've got a little bit of research to do with that, but um, we'll keep families informed. We also have uh, Facebook and Instagram pages that can pe keep people up to date. There is our website. Um, Patrick's done a lot of work on updating our website, and there's lots of um, good information on that site. And of course, time to time, um, we still need to send things home in, in hard copy. Uh, when that happens, students take them home or they get sent home, we've just got to make sure they get returned to the front office. So in the, in the world of technology, one thing that's never changed, uh, even with that, is occasionally hard copy documents go home in school bags and they're still there six weeks later. Um, that's no one's fault, it's just the way the world operates, I think. So occasionally we just need to be alert to hard copy information going home as well. Yes, thank you for that. So, so permission forms can be accessed electronically through the website. <laughs> Follow the prompts. Any questions about any of that around communication? Uh, communication, actually, I'll be, I'm happy to be brutally candid here, is an area of the school that we think we need to get better at, get better at. and uh, certainly some of the things I've mentioned here this evening part of those efforts to be better with communicating with our families. So um, it's an area that we're really interested in getting feedback on because uh, I think as we all know, communication is a pretty critical thing. Okay. Hey. Okay, so reports and parent-teacher interviews. Reporting is very similar to a junior or a primary setting. So you'll receive an a end of semester report that focuses on all the key learning that happened in the first one and term one and two, and then an end of year report that focuses on the term three and four. Reports look slightly different in a senior setting. They are more um, allocated in, in strands, being that different teachers teach different subjects. And you receive a report for every single subject. So at the moment in a primary setting, we focus mainly on our English and our maths as our main curriculum areas that we report to because that is what we spend the majority of our time as a classroom teacher is doing. Secondary reports, you'll have an individual report from every single teacher that they see. So they do look slightly different, but the reporting schedule is still the same. 
So although we do have our interim reports that go home in Terms 1 and Terms 3, and they're accompanied with our parent-teacher interviews, they are by no means the only time you will receive feedback on your student and the progress that they're making. So should there be any concerns, questions, um, you know, follow up that the teachers, they would contact you through currently what is our class dojo or potentially a different platform next year. So these are the final um, assessment pieces that come out. The thing that's different about our reports in the secondary as well is that they focus on assessment pieces rather than overall. So currently if you look at your maths curriculum, it's the overall ability in all the areas of maths where there might be a specific test or a specific assignment that the students were required to um, complete and that's what they're marked against for their assessment. So they do look slightly different but all of it can be communicated through by the teachers and are always welcome to um, speak to the teachers if you've got any questions in regards to any of those assessments. Another thing that's slightly different uh, is the book list. So in the junior school or in a primary setting, the majority of the supplies are given to the students at the start of the year. So any of the textbooks or stationery they are able to um, get from their classroom teacher. In the secondary setting, they are required to complete their book list and bring along all of the textbooks that are on their current book list or the sta and stationery as well that accompanies that. So the stationery is what is recommended and the reason they're recommended is because the teachers know what they will be teaching throughout the year, so therefore they know what will best suit that particular classroom. The brand itself doesn't necessarily matter as much, but absolutely if they ask for something like a protractor, there's a reason they've asked for that. It's not just because they felt like um, putting some extra things on the list. There's, there's a very valuable reason. So we can currently go through camp in education and all of this can be done online. And you receive a book list that is very detailed so you don't have to question whether or not you've got the right books. Um, Camping is fantastic on its online ordering system that it, it will make sense when you see these seven textbooks. They're all there. It's, it's very straightforward. You don't need to go out and source them independently and, and try and work out who the companies are. One thing that is very different, as Keith um, noted, mentioned before, with very wide deep devices, very, yep. um, because if, if you do happen to go second hand for any of your book lists, just make sure that you get any processes about an online edition. So should you go and um, you know, get the, the history book second hand of somebody who might have um, been able to sell it to you at a little bit less of a cost, just make sure that if they do have that accompanying um, product ID number, that you can get that as well because we're finding more and more the interactive abilities that the online devices can provide in a classroom supersede the textbooks by far. So just as one thing that has sort of come out, make sure you do get any product keys so that you can access the whole um, item. And we are actually able to contact the companies themselves and find out if, if necessary. So if you ever need anything, don't ever hesitate to contact the office and we can try and point you in the right direction as well. Okay, uh, lunchtime activities. So uh, here at uh, Commonwealth Lincoln Grammar School, we try to keep the, the kids busy so they can't get into mischief. Uh, as you can see there at the moment, they are uh, lunchtime activities available. Um, so right through the week there's always something that they, they can go off and do. Uh, on top of that our gym is open, uh, supervised, uh, on Tuesday and Thursday at lunchtime. Uh, and the Year 7s, they're up to date. Um, the 5-6 was allowed to use the fitness side of things, so the treadmills and the, the, um, the spin bikes and things like that. Uh, but come Year 7, they are actually allowed to start experimentally, experimenting with uh, the strengthening side of things, and that's under strict guidance. Um, but you know, just have a little play around, not trying to lift uh, deadlift records and things like that. But just to get a little bit of a taste, because again, uh, that is an opportunity in years to come uh, to use it to its fullest potential. Uh, our school canteen, um, as you, most of you are probably aware, uh, our school canteen has gone online. So pretty much it's a cashless, um, cashless canteen because of uh, COVID. Keep that in the backside. So ordering online. Um, 
With the Year 7s, again, they are allowed to go up and purchase stuff from the window, which is only open at lunchtime. Um, but otherwise, you know, uh, getting that through the canteen makes it through uh, through the online service, makes it a lot easier to then just bang, there's your lunch, well done, thanks for coming. All right, so I would really strongly recommend that you continue with the with the orders online because there is, it's only limited stuff that's available actually through, um, through the window service. Our uniform, as I touched on before, um, our sporting uniform, as you can see the two girls there, that first picture on the inside right uh, at the top. Um, you notice the tracksuit top, we have actually <coughs> said that our soft sail jacket uh, can be part of our, our uniform. We found that we had a few parents sort of saying that the tracksuit top wasn't warm enough. Um, so kill two birds with one stone. We've got this beautiful jacket which does cost a bit. So um, we're more than happy for the students to, to wear those with their sporting uniform. Uh, when they get to year seven, they have this, or, you know, year seven upwards, have this tendency to try and buck the system a little bit. Um, the white sock, white above the ankle socks, unbranded, is what we're asking people to wear. Uh, of course, doesn't always work, and uh, we're ongoing battle. But um, yeah, we all can wear it beautifully, and then we don't have, have too many problems. Uh, that other picture on top right is our winter uniform. Um, uh, so with the ties, uh, long pants, long shirt for the girls. They've got the kilts. Um, they are allowed to wear the pants as well and things like that if they uh, decide to do so. Uh, the bottom, um, bottom pictures, if we go through those, uh, the first one on the inside, of course, is our summer uniform. Um, so the girls got their dress and again our socks, um, white and uh, above ankle. Uh, there are accessories available, so we've got our beanies and our and our scarves, but any, any accessory that um, students want to wear should be in the school colours um, uh, of maroon, white, or, or navy. And, uh, and again, then we've got the, the little kids. Uh, they are all available from Memphis when available, because again, COVID has upset the orders and there's been dribs and drabs and things like that. But hopefully, come next year, um, we'll have a full stock ready to go uh, to appease. Uh, everyone's needs. And finally, our mobile phone policy. Um, we realise that the young people of our generation uh, seem to have this thing connected with them 24 7, um, which isn't ideal. So, what we ask students to do is uh, they're allowed to have it out in public, you know, using it um, up till the start of school, and then it should not be on their person. Uh, if it is, uh, initially there'll be a warning, uh, confiscation, again, if it were to continue, then uh, they'd be contact home saying, you just, you've got to take control and not bring it to school, or, you know, ask, ask for it to be handed in at the start of the day if the person's over abusing that privilege. During the day, some teachers may ask for it to be used in their classes, all right, but other than that, it does not come out until the end of the day. And then if you need to contact uh, your child at any time of the day, it should come through the office and the office will, will um, deliver that message uh, to your child. Yes, Mr. Wallace. Do you mind if I say a couple things about the mobile phone as well? You go for it. So uh, up until uh, 2022, uh, mobile phones were something that our senior school, our senior senior school, could access during the day. So I mean, our Year 10, 11, and 12 students. But what we were, and, and they had access to those phones. Um, they had to stay within the BC Centre. They weren't allowed to have doors with them, um, and they had access to them at recess and lunch. And I think what we were finding was that um, uh, it was creating, I think, as far as I'm concerned, anyway a pretty uh, anti-social sort of environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this year we've moved uh, so that uh, that mobile phone policy that Mr O'Brien explained to us is relevant right across years seven to 12. And by and large, our students have been really good with that. Um, is that correct? 
first of all. <coughs> Line lines have been pretty Fine. good. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we have the, the odd person who seems to think they can uh, get on their phone in your time, but um, we make sure we correct that. And what I've seen this year, and I, I'm absolutely confident when I say this, uh, instead of groups of students standing around or sitting around and there being zero communication except with the screen, what we've got is lots more vibrancy, lots more just discussion and dialogue and, and social connection um, in that senior area, and I think that's been a really good outcome. So I think that's been a good thing that we've done this year. And the expectation too is, uh, you know, if the kids go off in, on excursions, sporting events, um, camps and things like that, again, this rule still applies. Uh, so, yeah. All right, that brings us to any questions? We have a full one. Mr. Will, be happy to answer them. <laughs> Mr. Hall. What's the plan for class sizes and class numbers for year seven next year? Um, at the moment, they're sitting on around about 30 for year seven. Uh, so, ASC policy, and so for people who aren't aware of it, our school, um, Cobbleman and Grammy School, is part of the Elegant Schools Commission. So, there's 16 schools in the Elegant Schools Commission system. Put that video up there. Oh, thank you. So, there's 16 schools in the Elegant Schools Commission system. Um, the Diocese of Wangaratta there is Cathedral College Wangaratta, uh, Cochrane Anglican Grammar School, soon to be All Saints um, Anglican School in Shepparton, and Trinity Anglican College in Aubrey. Um, and as part of ASC policy, uh, we're, we're, we're directed to have class size to a maximum of 32. Um, uh, will we go that high? Um, we would prefer not to, um, but certainly we don't want to be turning students away um, at this stage either. And in time, uh, we're hoping over this next two or three years that with our numbers coming through the junior setting, uh, we'll be moving to two streams in the senior school. And I would envisage in time that that would mean that our, our class numbers um, in the senior classes probably would be um, having a three in front of them. One of the things that I do know, and, and I'm not trying to sell this to families at all, um, um, because I honestly do believe this. Um, I'm no expert in anything, but I've had a lot of experience in education. And um, look, there's very little evidence to show that class size uh, has a detrimental effect on the young person's learning. Um, if you've got good procedures in place and you've got quality teachers, that's, that's what determines good learning outcomes for the young people. And so that's what we're, we're looking at trying to, um, to work around. Um, and look, and the other thing too is, Again, from experience, I can assure you that um, I've, uh, over lots and lots of years, um, I've had classes of, um, of 30 that have just been absolutely magnificent to teach, and I've looked forward to going to every one of them. I've had classes of 10, 12, 15 that I've dreaded and thought, gee, do I really have to go to this group today? So just my own experience around that is it would tell me that the class size doesn't always it's certainly not a critical factor as far as I'm concerned in good outcomes for young people. And socially, uh, I think it's a really good spin-offs because there's greater opportunity for young people to form good friendship and, and work groups in a slightly larger group. Appreciate your opinion. The options have their own opinion on the last class. Oh, absolutely. Personal opinion is based on input, but socially. No, I appreciate that comment, Greg. Um, I think one of the things in Victorian education is that uh, culturally, probably, um, 30 does sound like a lot. Um, um, our, our governors, the ASC, uh, that's their policy. So that's, that we are directed to do that. Um, and as much as it's a cultural thing, I think it's probably a cultural thing that parents uh, um, would anticipate that number as being too large. I think by and large, teachers who are good at their job would say that the, that the class number is not a determining factor in um, good, good outcomes. And I respect your opinion, and yeah. absolutely there's lots of different views around that. I think we say that as well, because some of teachers could try to manage that they're used to different as well. I'd like to know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Um, do we, if 
you know, if we do see that you know a child is full of environment, then do you have like teachers and stuff? How do you do the We do. So um, again, this area we've been working really hard on, um, and I think it's probably something that COVID has highlighted for us. So um, I'm not going to I'm not going to suggest that. Um, um, our school, like lots of other schools, like every other school, um, haven't got students who have lagged in their learning and, and potentially also their social interaction because of the COVID experience. I'm not trying to use COVID as an excuse or a cop out for everything, but it's a reality. Um, so we are working on making sure that right across our school foundation of 12, uh, we've got their support staff in place that are required. So students who have um, uh, individual special needs are catered for, and, and in some cases we put um, special ed staff into classes just to uh, uh, lend a little bit of support with small group work and the like. So it's something we, we're, we're increasingly dedicating more resources to that area. Any other questions? Always have any questions for me? Anyone else? Good. Okay, I think that's pretty close to where we are. So, um, just before we finish up, I'd like to thank um, Mr. O'Brien and Mrs. Rathbone for being here and presenting. I would like to thank um, Mrs. Sharon Nye and Mr. Patrick Tansy for their work in putting uh, our two information nights to, uh, together tonight. Um, we've got Mrs. Fiona Clark here, who's our new head of junior school. I probably should have introduced Fiona earlier. My apologies for that. So just as I've introduced Mr. John Thompson at our new head of senior school for next year, over here we've had Mrs. Fiona Clark, who's been with us for 18 months now. Um, Fiona is a star, um, has come over from the um, government um, school uh, setting at the beginning of last year. We're really looking forward to um, having Fiona assist us, um, not just the junior school, but of course there's lots of crossover between junior school and senior school. And over here we have Ms. Jay Doyle, who is our head of anthem identity. So anybody who's got any questions around anthem identity um, or rave or those elements of the schooling experience, um, Shay is here this evening to, uh, to provide the answers. And potentially, because um, I'm 58 years of old and don't know anything about IT, uh, James, thanks so much for being here tonight and making sure that everything worked teaching how to press the button to make the thing rotate, whatever it's called. Okay. Appreciate that very much. Any other questions? Okay, we have some a little bit of hospitality up here, um, a little bit of finger food and a cup of tea or coffee. Um, please help yourself uh, to any of that and um, if there's any staff here that you'd like to catch up with before you head home, please take the opportunity. But thanks again so much for coming out tonight. Um, what evenings like this reinforce for me is that, um, is that education, a school can only provide so much and a family can only provide so much and uh, education is all around a collaborative approach. And so if we've got families and schools working closer together, that's how we get the best outcomes for our young people. And so your attendance here tonight, I think, um, is representative of, of, of that notion of a collaborative approach to get those best outcomes. So thanks everybody for being here. I really appreciate it.